Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another week. Boy, it's going to be interesting to see what difference this summer is from other summers as we go along in time. So we're going to look at some uh, uh, cell communication stuff, right? So here's my good, this is a classic fraternity hat with Bobby Bowden's signature on it. If you don't know who Bobby Bowden is, Kayla, it's time for you to go do some research. A great American icon. So here we go. So I've divided this up into three or four units. And this one, we're going to talk about um, uh, chemical signaling between cells. Cells communicate by direct contact, by short distance communication using things called local regulators. Local means short distance, right? And then long distance. But all of it has very common, a uh, very uh, things quite in common. That was easy to say, right? Uh, a molecule might be released by a cell or it might be held by a cell. A molecule fits into a receptor on another molecule. The connection of those complementary shaped molecules, right, triggers a signal pa transduction pathway to make something happen differently in this cell, often the use of a gene. So this unit connects a whole bunch of units as well. All right, so here we go with uh, first uh, direct contact. So here we have illustrative examples. Now I want you to notice this. When you see here in the syllabus, when you see things in blue shaded boxes, that means you need to know this. But when you see stuff in boxes that aren't blue sh shaded, those are called illustrative examples. And these are put in the syllabus basically for teachers saying here, Here's some good examples you can use uh, for this stuff, but your students don't need to know these specifically, but it's not a bad idea. And obviously, if you use them, you're going to bump into those terms and the certain terms here. So we'll mention them all, but that's what it means when you see a box that's not blue highlighted. That's a good examples of these concepts, but you don't specifically need to know about antigen presenting cells. Um, but here we go. So this one right here, very simply, this goes back to cell structure, right? These plasmodesma are kind of like gateways from one plant cell to another, by which things like maybe auxin, that signal molecule that tells a cell to expand and cause that plant to bend toward the light. Remember that story? Um, so this made their list of a cell-to-cell -cell contact. These two cells are contacting each other at this connection called a plasmodesma, and it's helping them communicate. Right. Another example we talked about here is in these white blood cells, right, the helper T's and the killer T's, and these antigen presenting cells that are talking to them again by cell to cell contact. So here you have that story that there's a molecule, that's the antigen, right, that is kind of taking a message from, get out of there, from one cell to another. But those cells are actually physically connecting for that message to be sent. And they typically, I mean, they, they have mentioned here killer T cells. Those are the cytotoxic ones we, we called or the natural killer ones, if you remember those. But you don't need to know those specifics. They might tell you a story about cell communication and ask you, do you know the concept? The concept is this. Their connection is due to a very specific fit between a receptor and some kind of molecule, in this case, we'd call it an antigen, right? And that connection, that communication tells this cell, hey, I want you to use some different genes, and I want you to make some different proteins, and I want you to do something different. Okay, so now we're going to blend these two columns, right? Here is, again, the antigen-presenting cell and the interleukin, excuse me, and the, um, the helper T cell, right? They are, by direct contact, communicating. This guy has says, hey, I just ate this bad guy. I broke him up, and I'm holding out a piece of him for you to go into action against this bad guy. That's my communication by cell-to-cell -cell contact. But look what I also did. I also sent you a chemical, right, not through direct contact, but in a pretty close short distance, you're local. And I'm going to regulate your activity with the help of this chemical, 
which falls into the category called a cytokine when you're talking about this short distance communication between white blood cells, right? And cytokines made the illustrative example list, right? Remember, just one last time, this blue box means know this stuff. This not blue box means this is a good example of this stuff. We might tell you a story about these, but you don't need to know what the word cytokine means unless it's in a blue box. Okay, so look what the helper T cell does. It sends these signal molecules to these guys. They have receptors that can attach to specifically these, and it causes them to do something different. One of the things they do differently is they start to divide. So that's part of here. Okay, actually. So here's a neurotransmitter. It's a molecule of the type we would call a signal molecule. We would also call it a local regulator in their language because it's going to talk to from one cell to another over a very short distance. And this distance is very short. This thing we call a synapse is almost direct contact between a little branch of this nerve cell and the surface of this nerve cell. But these little green, in this case, neurotransmitters are released by this cell. They attach to a specifically shaped receptor. That is part of every communication story here. And they cause this cell to do something different, specifically in this case, open this gate and let sodium in. So here we have a story that has all kinds of connections with other units. These neurotransmitters are held in vesicles which were produced by Golgi way back here. Uh, the, the chemicals were produced by ribosomes because they're proteins. The recipe for those proteins is in genes back here in the nucleus. They were moved here by cytoskeleton. We got all kinds of stories going on here. They were released by exocytosis. So this is a neat story here. So we're still in the short distance by local regulators category, right? These things are called morphogens, but again, this is not shaded blue, so you don't need to know that word specifically, but these things generate the form, morph, in a growing embryo. They cause you to grow arms and legs and things like that. Um, so uh, I'm, I picked a couple examples. Um, one of them is the morphogen called bicoid, by, because it's what triggers the head end, tail end of, in this case, a fruit fly. This is a little baby fruit fly. It's made of a bunch of cells, right? But cells at one end are actively using some genes to make this protein that's then diffusing throughout. And so cells at this end are going to get a heavy dose of that chemical. Cells at this end are going to get the, the least dose. And here it's the concentration, the dose that's going to make the difference. This heavy dose tells cells at this end, hey, why don't you use some genes and become the head of this fruit fly? And here, why don't you use the genes to become the tail and, and then everything in between as well? Ha, look at that. This is the guy who won the Nobel Prize for discovering this protein bicoid and how it works and all this local regulation stuff. This is at Princeton. Uh, this is a few years back. It looks like um, uh, hadn't been enough time for the sun to lighten my hair as much as it is now. So uh, Eric Wishhouse is his name, Nico. So here's the second example. This is kind of neat. When you're about an eighth of an inch long, and that's like that much, literally. When you're an eighth of an inch long, you look kind of like this, and you're starting to grow arms and legs. And here's what's happening at them. Some cells here on the tip are producing a chemical, much like the Bicoid story. It's diffusing, and these cells are getting a high dose of it. And that chemical is communicating to those cells to use some genes to become a hand. And then the low dose is communicating to these cells, hey, why don't you use the genes to become a shoulder? And then in the middle, how about you becoming an elbow? This is the communication story over short distances by that local regulator that in this case is called sonic hedgehog, right? And the gene that produces it to cause these big developmental changes is that kind of gene we have before called the Hox gene and we'll come back to later, okay? So now here you got another, uh, another set of cells that's producing a similar protein that's diffusing this way and the ones that get the heavy dose of this are gonna become little finger and the ones that get the less dose is gonna become thumb and this is how we have learned 
your limbs grow and every other part of you too. Okay, so here now we go to the long distance, right? We'll do this kind of quickly. Here we have these signals. What are they? They're chemicals. These are mostly the chemicals that we call hormones, right? These signals are released by one kind of cell type, travel long distances, often through the bloodstream, to the cell with the right receptor, the target cell of another cell type. So here we have a list of illustrative examples, right? Here I hit the two sex hormones, and this basic one, this part of the brain called the hypothalamus, releases this chemical that when it hits on cells in this part of the brain, which is really right next to it, way up there, right? They have the right receptor for that to bind to signal transduction pathway, use some different genes to produce these molecules. These molecules then travel all the way to the testes or ovaries, and they then tell those cells, cell communication, to make yet different chemicals. And now we're gonna weave into what'll be the third unit here, these chemicals are going to go back and bump into these cells and say, hey, there's enough of us. You can stop making this stuff that leads to the making of this. And our levels are going to be nice and steady. This is the homeostasis idea by negative feedback. All of these are also in the negative feedback story illustrative example list. So here I'll do just one other one. Thyroid hormones are in the list. And there, there's a bunch of different thyroid hormones. So here's a couple. We're going to see a couple different ones later. Um, this is, again, about negative feedback, right? In this case, what's it keeping steady? Calcium levels, right? And so there's two hormones here. One of them causes calcium levels in the blood to fall by having calcium absorbed. The other one causes it to increase by releasing calcium, mostly from bones. And so by their combined action, they do this negative feedback stuff. But also part of the story here is these chemicals are being released by cells here. They're traveling a fairly long distance. They're bumping into other cells, which then get the message and do something different to like absorb more calcium or produce more calcium. And there we go. That's our uh, story for today. Uh, the next one's going to be about signal transduction pathways. Hope you're having a great day and a great week, and I hope the sun's shining where you are. Bye-bye.